to, to recognize what are the classes, and if you haven't, that would give an impetus to, for you to get into one of those classes. What I want to do today is move into what would be Philip in continuing with chapter eight, and we talked about how the Holy Spirit led Philip to Samaria. What we find so amazing is I've been doing about Saul and particularly the Apostle of Grace and last Sunday, particularly about Saul and this uh, revelation, Paul and his revelation of the communion. Of course, we all know about Paul's missionary journey, that's the first and the second and the third, but what we may not realize, he's not the first. In fact, the first was a missionary journey into Sanhedrin, into the very center of the religious group in Jerusalem, and of course you find that Stephen was stoned to death, the first martyr. But then when you turn to Philip, he actually is the first missionary. He goes to Samaria. And then from there, what we are doing today is Gaza for one man. After a great revival in the city of Samaria, he's moving into the dust bowls, into the what would be uh, the uh, literally uh, famine-stricken place with nothing there, an old city called Gaza, and into an old road that nobody uses in those days. Let me just begin by saying there are 10 points, we're going to run fast, so don't worry about it. each verse is a point. But when you go into this man, Philip, you find it begins with persecution. So when you read Acts chapter 8 and verse 1, right off the bat, it begins by saying, and Saul was consenting to his death, and at that time there was a great persecution, great persecution, though this is the time of great persecution, and they're going to find this is what becomes an impetus for people as they went. As you read the next couple of verses, we don't need that time. Everywhere they were scattered, they began to preach the gospel. So persecution brought about something. While the big gun stayed in Jerusalem, it stirred people up, and they understood the commandment of the Lord in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, go into all the world, and they were moving into Judea. Then they were moving into Samaria, exactly as the Lord had said they would. The Spirit of God is moving. How be it, it comes with a shake. It comes with a, with a, 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 a price to pay. And now when you look at, uh, in the next verse 8, it says there was great joy in the city of Samaria, let's say. And so we find this is what takes place at the time of persecution. Uh, Philip is going all the way to Samaria. That is interesting because Samaria lies between what would be the north, Galilee, and from Galilee south of Jerusalem, sandwich in between is this place, Samaria. And what you also find is between the two uh, devout Jews, or just about anybody in those days would not take their via Samaria. We went through that passage because these they considered as to be low down and basically um, not considered to be worthy and so forth. And there was no end of hatred between the two. The Lord Jesus was the first one who traveled and began to speak about the nobility of the great, of the Samaritans, and he gives classic examples of the Samaritan as the hero. Now, when you go into what would be verse 26, you're going to find now from there, the angel of the Lord, chapter 8 and verse 86, the angel of the Lord commands uh, Philip now to go uh, and... Uh, 8.26. Let me go into the Bible. And here it finds here in 8.26, And the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, saying, Arise and go towards south unto the way that goes down from Jerusalem to Gaza. So here is a, a, like a zigzag. Now he went basically Samaria, and from there the angel of the Lord is saying, Go by way of the south to Jerusalem unto Gaza. So again, what a roundabout way for Samaria, Jerusalem, and all the way to Gaza, which is a desert, a famine-stricken place, so to speak. Remember, a few decades ago, Alexander had come in and totally destroyed Gaza, the main seven cities of the Philistines, and what he did was uh, he constructed a new road. So this dusty road was a, a passage that no one would travel, and that is precisely what the Holy Spirit is telling Philip, why there is one solitary person 
someone from a different culture, from someone from a different race. And into this one solitary phase, if I was in the praise of Philip or you, were you saying, God, you made a mistake. This isn't the place. I've just seen a great revival. Mighty signs, wonders, revival, great joy in the city. And this dust team, a place called Gaza into an old street that is condemned, and you put me in a Philip is obedient. So this is incredibly amazing. What I like about this particular passage, mission to Gaza, uh, just like the Samaria, where there's mighty uh, acts of God, great deliverance, uh, people were delivered, people were saved, signs, wonders, and miracles, all by this man. But when you look at what I like about this, per, about Philip, is suddenly there is what is considered uh, a direction from the Holy Spirit and from the angels. So when you go to chapter 8 and verse 86, the angel of the Lord said, and this is what it says, sets him in direction, and that is what the angel of the Lord spake unto Philip, arise and go towards south unto the way that goeth down from Jerusalem. So here is the angel giving direction, and that is something notable because you don't find directions like that, uh, and here is particularly not even to an apostle, but just someone who waited at the table feeding the seniors. And here God is sending angels to death. If that's not enough, you find the Holy Spirit also giving direction to Philip. You find in chapter 8, and when you read uh, particularly in a couple of verses, verse uh, 26, uh, I think verse 29, just look at verse 29, you're going to find, and the Spirit said unto Philip, go near and join your yourself to the chariot. So this is the Holy Spirit specifically speaking to Philip that he brought by way, by way of the desert into this uh, solitary place for one solitary man. And the Holy Spirit is saying, go and get yourself near to, the, near to this chariot. And again, when you turn to chapter 8 and verse 39, you're going to find the Holy Spirit again speaking to him. And they came up out, out of the way, out of the water, the Spirit of God, the Holy Spirit, caught up Philip, that the eunuch saw him no more, and he went his way, that is, the eunuch went his way rejoicing. Just like that, the Holy Spirit, so to speak, snatched Philip away. So the Holy Spirit is very active in this chapter, beginning first in Samaria, we talked about the deliverance, the miracles, but here for one person, the angel is in operation, the angels are subject to and ministering to the people of God, but in this case specifically directing Philip for the salvation, not for anything else, to bring people to the Lord. And the Holy Spirit is speaking to Philip. I know about Paul, he's an apostle, and especially chosen instrument, but Philip, it's amazing how the Holy Spirit, he chooses whom evil and directs whom evil. So here you find that the Holy Spirit snatches away Philip, and then this eunuch is all by himself. Hey, he's saved, he's baptized, he's on his way back to Ethiopia. Number three, I just want to talk about, it's important we understand the balance between the Word and the Spirit. And the reason I say that is because in Acts chapter 1, verse 8, we talked about a little earlier, go into all the world and preach the gospel. That was the direction from the Lord. That is the word of the Lord. So all of this is being played out in Philip. And again, you see in all of the great men, including very much Philip, uh, Paul. But the Holy Spirit is being used, but the word of God is very active. While the Word of God is very active, it is also in a sense in how the Holy Spirit is directing Philip. And I want you to understand this. The Word of God compels him. The Word of God is urging him. The Word of God is motivating Philip. So if you were to take chapter 8, verses 4 and 5, this is, he's moved by the Word. And they that were scattered abroad, this, they went about preaching. Why? Persecution drove them, and it was the Word that was preached by the Lord, instructed by the Lord before he was resurrected in Acts chapter 1-8, they are playing out 
They're active. They're basically standing on the word. And even while they are being uh, persecuted, they went everywhere preaching the word, preaching the word. Very important. Again, in verse 5, another aspect of this word, they therefore, in verse 5, and Philip went down to the city of Samaria and preached Christ to them. So, here is Philip. We don't see in particularly the word Spirit of God mentioned, but the Spirit of God urges, and the Spirit of God is basically anointing the word, and Philip goes down to the city. What made Philip go down to the city? He should be taking care of the senior woman, and he should be basically waiting on the table. No, he is, because he was compelled, a passion, and this is a word that moves him to be able to go all the way to Samaria and preach Christ to them. So hold this thought for a moment. We talked also how important it is the Word is the one that helps us to grow. And the Spirit of God helps us in such a way, illuminating uh, Spirit anoints the Word, and we need the Word and the Spirit. So we talked about how it was a supernatural way in verse uh, uh, third 26, the angel guided. In verse 29 and 39, the Holy Spirit guided. They are very important. Now, it's a very important balance. The word is the basis on which we move, not opposing, not contrary to the word of God. And I want to say this very importantly because there must be a tremendous balance. Because what you're finding is people moving and they say the Holy Spirit is guiding them. And contrary many times to what would be what the word is saying. They just prophesy things and there's no basis to that. And today, like it was uh, centuries before, People who come out, good people, Bible-believing people, spirit of spill people, get up and basically veer away without the base in the word, and all their preaching is sheer imagination. There's a great church, very big church. The pastors are being used prophets. In fact, they're mighty people until they began to prophesy, XYZ is going to be the president in 2020. <laughs> that is the most important thing. I got a letter, uh, the church received a letter, and I happened to open it, and tells me, this is the person that should be the president, and quoted some passage from the book of Revelation. What connection is there with the political person and the scriptures? That is what is happening. Not simply to say what they did was wrong because all they talked about in 2020, was it 2020? Yeah, 2020, was totally wrong. So, in other words, where would they get this basis if it was the prophets were right? It was wrong. In the Old Testament, they'll be taken out of the city and stoned. We live in the New Testament, so I want you to understand the... Christian, the born-again person, must judge these words, not the word of God, the purported prophecy of God. What is so sad is we're seeing today like nobody's business. Words coming out, words coming out. In fact, I listened to a preacher because someone said you should listen to him. He's mightily used. And I'm not being critical that way, but I'm listening. He quoted scriptures, but what he said was totally different from the scriptures. He quoted the passage, but the words. And then he goes on to say, I may not be exactly, but this is what the Holy Spirit impressed me. The Holy Spirit is impressing you, say sheer nonsense, by quoting this passage in the Bible? Absolutely not. God will not change. And you know how many people are flocking to this super spiritual, and particularly some great people, particularly with this thing called the new apostolic, uh, 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 NA, um, I forget what the last name, uh, Reformation, N-A-R. Great, great, you call, they are mightily used of God. They are powerful men of God. I'm going to say they are powerfully used, but what's going on is they are moving on without strong support on the word. If you hear their preaching, it's all about, this is what the Holy Spirit is telling me, this is what, and by the time you talk about it, it's veered away from the word. I want to say this, we got to balance everything with the word. Amen. Very important. Now, that being said, I wanted to understand, we need to realize the Holy Spirit 
what he does is anoints the word of God. We need the word. We need the Holy Spirit. So when I say something, people say, oh, no, we cannot uh, let the Holy Spirit. No, that's not what I'm saying. I'm saying both are important. The word is very important, but the word without the spirit basically makes us cold. It becomes formal. It becomes traditional. It becomes pharisaical. But without the Spirit, that happens. But the Spirit without the Word just blows us up. And like a fading star, a shooting comet, we go and boom, we're gone. Look at the number of great preachers in the past. Some of the two of the greatest preachers that I admire most. One is William Seymour. And the other is William, um, what was his name was, I forget. One of the greatest uh, uh, healing evangelists, uh, all of all great evangelists comes from him. Until I began to read their personal diaries, now is exposed. My God, they veered right off the path into what is spiritualism. I don't say spirit of God, spiritism. Very, very much. What happened? They went from the word into their feelings to the point they felt that they are always right. So this person who sends these letters to me, I even doubt what he's talking about. What has he got to do with politics? And telling us the revelation tells you this. What nonsense are you talking about? Revelation talks about in the last days what will happen, not about this election. Yeah, amen. Nope. But yet how many people will listen to this nonsense? Very important, while we need to understand and undergird everything with the word, 1 Timothy chapter 5 and verse 19 is very strong. It simply says, don't stop the Spirit of God from moving. It's very important that we do not block the Holy Spirit. We need the word, but we desperately need. And the book of Acts is about the action of the Holy Spirit. That is what the book of Acts is, action of the Holy Spirit in the lives of ordinary people. So that's number four point. Number five is uh, simply, uh, uh, I think when you look at verse 37, what we find this passage in Acts chapter 8 and verse 37 introduces for the first time this man, and it says, and uh, and as they went their way, they came unto a certain word, and I'm sorry, in verse 27, and he arose and went, and behold, look, a man of Ethiopia, a eunuch of great authority under Candace, queen of Ethiopians, who had the charge of all her treasure and had come to Jerusalem to worship. Obviously, he's a proselyte. He's basically not Hebrew. He's based uh, from a different color, from a different race. But somewhere he made contact with the, diops the Jewish diopsera, and he came to know the truth. Uh, and so he became what would be a proselyte or a follower. And he went all the way to, no matter how he could be looked down upon, but he would go down to to this festival. So he's gone to Jerusalem. He's on his way back, and he's got an entourage. He's a big, important person. He's in the finance of this Queen of Shandis, which is a regular name, basically, in uh, uh, Sudan, and that's a Greek word uh, for queens. And what you find is this man is coming. He's reading the scriptures a very uh, unusual way without giving the name. The Holy Spirit is telling us about one individual and telling us that he's a man of authority and telling us that he is uh, a person who's a eunuch, and now they are emasculated uh, by the kings and the powers that be for many reasons. For one, that in the harem that they have, they would not mess up with their many wives. And so, and, but these people have risen to high position because of their loyalty and faithfulness to the king. And so you can read in the, uh, in the history of these men that have risen to high position because of their filial, with his, uh, their loyalty, because of their faithfulness. And this man is in a high position. In spite of the fact that uh, whatever has happened in the past, but he's faithful and he's basically coming down to Jerusalem while it is very specifically mentioned he is very powerful with the queen. So to speak, he's authorized by that. Now, I want you to understand the word Ethiopian is very important. What would be, by that time, when you're looking at the ancient history, uh, Ethiopia is not simply what was called Abyssinia, but also, very importantly, it was part of the Sudanese kingdom, very powerful kingdom. It, it is a terrible tragedy what has happened. It's basically brought down. In fact, 
around those earliest time, you're going to find it was not Egypt. It was Sudan that was so well off, their own kingdom. Uh, the, it's historically, basically, what the students of history have done is make this Ethiopia, uh, Egypt so big because they were of lighter skin. That's about the best, I could say. But in doing so, the study, a whole branch of history, they changed history, made Ethiopia to be so big, not mentioning anything about Sudan. It was from that joined Sudan, Ethiopia, and that was. Now, if you look at a couple of other words for Ethiopia, you're going to find Abyssinia, and you're going to find the word Kush that is from the, uh, from the black race. And that basically was one of the greatest civilization then. Uh, now what you're going to find is uh, also the fact the people are called the Nubians. Now, you may not know it, but the Highland Church did a demonstration at UN for the Nubians who were killed. Vast majority of South uh, Sudan, the Nubians, were basically killed. Something like 20 million people were killed. There was never came in the notice. It never came up there. It never comes even when the Nigerians are being killed and even when Libyan Christians were being sold as slaves in recent memory after ISIS. Nothing comes. Now, of course, everything centers around what is really taking place, but nobody talks about the mass slaughter. And this has taken place over the years. In Russia, 30 million Christians were killed. That is taking place all across the Asia and Africa, but nobody talks about it. But we did something for the Nubians. Uh, we went out and did a demonstration. Now, understand at that time, the Arabized Khartoum, this is from the capital, from the North Sudan, wiping out the Nubians, and there's a reason for it, and a lot of American companies and America and Canada got into the wagon because there was oil in Nubia. And that's all it, money makes big noise. So at that point, we went and demonstrated for the Nubians. We did that. And I want to, I think it was 2000-something at the beginning of this. But uh, what people don't know is while they were being killed, God answered the prayers of what would the Nubians, and they got their independence. Now something strange is happening. Not Sudan. The Khartoum government, Muslims killing Christians, uh, killing Muslims, and in South Sudan, Christians killing Christians. This killing never stops. And for all the prayers that went for Sudan, they're killing each other for oil. Now, this is not one color and that color. It's not one nation. It's the same people, the same religion, like Hutsi and Tutsi, pray for them. But there's a glimmer of a hope things are taking better place. But I'm just telling you history because it's very important for us to know what takes place because uh, this is important. So here, when you hear about Gaza, think about Gaza today. And so Gaza is a very important pivotal point in the Old Testament. Remember, that was where the Philistines go at. That's also the place where... Philip goes down, and there's a great conversion. And so Christianity goes all the way back before Islamization. And so it's a very important strategic place at that point. By the way, there's a large number of Christians in uh, there are Arab Christians. In fact, in the Philistines, there were like 10 to 12 to 15 person Christians. Now there's not even one person. They all ran away for their life, leaving everything behind. But what I wanted to understand is Philip is authorized, Philip is compelled by the word and by the angel directing him to Severia and now by the Holy Spirit directing him to what would be this place in Gaza of all place. In a desert, in a place which is an old road because uh, Alexander the Great had made a different road, a different route, and nobody travels by this, but God the Holy Spirit sent this man into a solitary path for a solitary soul. Very interesting, when you read about this man in verse 27, Ethiopian eunuch, you're going to find the fact whoever this man was, 
well known probably in the writings of the Ethiopian. Uh, and it's very interesting because when you read about this uh, uh, Christian story, you're going to find that he would have been the one who ignited the, uh, the message into Africa. Do you know some of the great theologians of the early century? I'm talking about the church fathers. They're discarded because when you read their writing, they do not care much for what takes place in the middle. In the middle. Their understanding is very different from the evangelical way of saying, oh, we got to support this. And, you know, they were very strong and they stood on. So many of the evangelicals reject the early church fathers. It's important we study the early church fathers, not the word of God, but they came closest to the apostles. In fact, most of the early church fathers had direct contact with Peter, Paul, and John the beloved. And so it's very important to understand their take of what they were going through the first and the second and the third century. By the way, some of the greatest church fathers comes from Africa, North Africa. I don't know if you heard the word uh, Cyprian, a great theologian. Tertullian, a defender of the faith in the first century and the second century. These are men who stood against all the things and they gave their life for the Lord from Africa. And then, of course, the greatest of them, the bishop ultimately of Hippo, who was an atheist, his mother prayed for him. And out comes one great man called Saint Augustine from South Africa. So what you need to recognize is uh, this is not the first man, the Ethiopian. Uh, uh, this is not the last man. He, and certainly he's the first man. That out of this, he goes to Ethiopia. And Ethiopia was one of the earliest, if not the earliest, nation to be Christianized. This is very important. And uh, I want to go into another passage in verse 10 to 30. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet. What are you talking about? Take, for example, the Holy Spirit says, go down, meet this man. And this man is going in his chariot. Of course, we're not talking about a chariot race. This is a large entourage. He's uh, reading his scriptures. They're not going fast. But Philip is running in to be able to catch up with the Ethiopian, with all his guards, and then he makes eye contact, and he first hears this man is reading from the Old Testament. The Holy Spirit is compelling this man to run for the sake of one person, compelling to grab hold of this chariot, then surrounded by his personal bodyguards, but willing for the sake of one man, because not simply an angel, but the Holy Spirit has spoken to him. This man must be very important. Amen. It doesn't matter what color, it doesn't matter what status, but the most important, I must run. And Philip ran thither to him and heard him read the prophet Isaiah and said to him, do you understand what are you reading? And what was he reading? He's reading from verse 32, the place of the scripture, which he read was, he was led as a sheep to the slaughter, and like a lamb that is dumb before a sharer, so he opened not his mouth. In his humiliation, his judgment were taken away, and who shall declare this generation, for his life is taken from the earth. And this is from directly from the passage from the book of Isaiah, chapter 1, uh, chapter uh, 53, verses 1 to 6. We read that even then to the communion, verse 5. He was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquity. He bore our chastisement by stripes. You are healed. That comes from uh, verse 5 of chapter 53 of the book of Isaiah. But he's reading this passage. And so... Uh, while he's reading, what is important is this man is reading an Old Testament. He doesn't have what would be our new uh, King James Version, or he doesn't have any version. He's having what is known as a scroll, which is basically rolling up, and in the moving of this uh, uh, uneven road, the man is reading loud because Philip could hear him. And he had to put his finger into an ear. This is what he was wounded for our transgression. So he doesn't understand. But he's reading. 
Now, I want you to understand very importantly, this is important that we recognize the word is very important. Once again, we're coming back to the word. The word is the basis from which Philip is able to speak to him. And he's asking, do you know what you are reading? And listen to his answer. He says, uh, is he, how do I know? I don't know what's going on. And so that basically is verse 30, and read the prophet, and he said, Philip is saying, do you understand what you're reading? And he says, how can I except some man guide me? And he decided, Philip, that he would come up and sit with them. Obviously, when this man in such authority saw Philip running in this lonely desert, there must be something about this man in the way in which he's directing. I'm reading the word, and the spirit most likely is bringing this man in a lonely road, running to catch up with me, and he's asking me, do not do you have some money, or do you have some food? He's asking you, do you understand what you're reading? So Philip has a grip of the word, and Philip is moved by the spirit. And so he says, how do I understand unless someone guides me? Perfectly to say, Philip, you are the one. The Holy Spirit is moving to do that. Now, one of the things we need to understand is in verse 35, a very important, this is the key to everything, whether it is to ministering, whether it is to evangelism, to just about any people in the world. And Philip opened his mouth and began at the same scripture. It could be just about any scriptures. He could have read about the temple. He could have read about the, uh, the sacrifice. He could have read about the priest. But he zeroes his way right and preached Christ. Everything in the Old Testament preaches about the Lord Jesus. So zero in on it and move down. So you're going to find, why didn't Philip use the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Acts, and Colossians, and Galatians, because those books were not yet printed. Mm -hmm. But understand, now the Old Testament is completed, and the Old Testament is revealed in the New Testament. So many times we use the Old Testament to give pictures, types, stories. They're all important. They become admonition. But if we build upon the New Testament, the revelation, the final revelation, after the book of Revelation, no more is added. That is the final. Nobody's word can par. And I heard one of the NA, our new apostolic revelation prophets saying, God is speaking, and I'm speaking just like Paul, my foot. <laughs> the Paul had the Holy Spirit. You can only reach out and speak from the word of God. Spirit of God will guide you, but this is not chapter and verse. And when I talk about this man, earlier I said I forgot his name, uh, William Seymour. Um, a mightly use of God of God, but towards the end, his disciples began to use chapter and verses. In fact, the, like the scriptures, Acts chapter 1, they wrote, this is what his message is, chapter 1, chapter 2. What nonsense. You are defying man, and this is how cults are formed. But he was one of the earliest Man used of God like, like the other man, William uh, Seymour. This man is William oh, Branham. Branham. Uh, sad one. Two great people towards the end, they just went haywire. They just went off the word and wouldn't basically base and put their pillar on the word. So when you see people preaching, they are not focused on the pillar of the word of God. And this is important we understand where we stand. The word is very important. Very quickly, in verse 35, listen to this. He zeroed it from what he was speaking, Isaiah chapter 53, and he zeroed right up to and preached. Philip opened his mouth, and this is the reason. And he preached Jesus to him. Running through, when you read in verse 30, 30 uh, uh, 6, as they went their way, there came a certain water, and the eunuch says, See, here is water. We don't get the whole conversation, but we can surmise that in the things that Philip talked about, Philip knew he is Jewish or a proselyte, and he said, you know, circumcision, I think this is what he has said, circumcision is the sign of the covenant, the Old Testament, but baptism is the sign of the fulfillment of the New Testament. You need to be baptized. Amen. So, 
one thing he's asking in verse, uh, th what doth in them mean to be baptized? I want you to understand, Philip preached the word to this man, and very important, it was not Sunday morning at 8 o'clock or 10.30. You can preach the word any day, any time, even in the middle of a desert. The other thing I wanted to know is, the you know the Ethiopian eunuch is saying, "What taught in me to be baptized? What is it that's stopping me?" Oh, you got to do eight lessons of Bible Institute. Then you get a certificate to become what would be masters in divinity. Then you come back, we examine you. It gets so long. There was no nothing like that. This is the only question in verse 37 Philip is uh, asking him. Yeah. Philip said, if you believe with all your heart. What? If you believe with all your heart. By the time the church was formed, there were many reasons why they did that. For the simple reasons why we have to put organizational schools, because we've seen abuses, so we said, let's just, so everything will be here. But at the beginning, it was so simple. What should I do to be saved? Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. What should I do to be, be baptized? you got to believe. And what does he say? He answered and said, I believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God. That is the biggest confession. Now, I do know we have to memorize some blue book and green book and the, and the church book. Listen, this is the most important. If you believe the Lord Jesus Christ with all your heart, you are saved. Confession is made with the mouth, and with the heart a man believes. That is simply that. Now, in order to be formulated into what would be in the ministry or something, we would like to add something more. But otherwise, it's straight and simple. Do you believe? So when you see water baptism, we don't garland him. We don't jump on the water and hallelujah. We just ask him, do you believe the Lord? That is so simple. That is scriptural. We don't need to add anything more. Do you believe in the Lord Jesus? Say, yes, I believe in the Lord Jesus. Based on that, we baptize you in the name of the Father and the, and the Holy Spirit, in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Boom. Done. Why do I use all this just in case somebody comes and says, you never got baptized the right way. So we cover all the corners. Yes, we were baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, and in the name of the Lord Jesus. Do you have any problem? We did it all. But s baptism is not salvation. It is after you are saved, your love for God is what you do. So you're not saved because of what you give, but because you love the Lord, you give. You're not saved because of all the praises you do, but after you're saved, you want to praise the Lord. That is very simple. Let me just run into something else. He was baptized. Somebody asked me, Pastor, why don't you continue baptizing people at 1030? I said, because it takes so long. Excuse me, but isn't it the right way to baptize? I said, no, it's not written. In fact, this man was not baptized Sunday 10.30 or 8.30. He was not even baptized in the church. He was baptized outside. I find that when baptism takes place, it gives less time for very important worship and equipping God's people. But when we have a baptism, say another day, and invite people, we not only baptize them, we ask them a testimony. We have to cut that. We don't do that. Okay, we've got X, Y, Z. Thomas, what is your testimony? Come in and tell us. It is everything centered around baptism. Otherwise, we have to run quickly, do this fast, phrase fast, then this fast, and in the end, you've got a conglomeration of total mess. This a little, that a little. Sunday is a time of worshiping. Sunday is a time of being uh, fed with the word. There is other days in a week. So I explained, said, no, that's not scripture. I said, give me the scriptures for it. I'll give you the scripture. So very important that you find, as they were on their way, they hear his water. And Philip said in verse 37, if you believe, and he said, yes, I believe. And he commanded the chariot to stop. Look at this. The man looked out while he was talking. I don't know how long a distance. Poor Philip has to travel miles and miles back. But that's not a problem. As they travel, they talk, they talk. And then I am sure it's not all because we'll be having a big fat book called the Bible. They don't put everything. What was important, the Holy Spirit put it in. 
What doth enter me? So obviously, nothing should enter you if you believe the Lord Jesus. He says, see, there is water. While he was talking, see the water. And why do we baptize a person fully? Because they went down. Listen to what he said in verse 30. He commanded the chariot as they stood. They went down. You don't jump into a little bottle of water, do you, to be sprinkled. You have to go down and be baptized. Baptized means immerse. And he baptized him there. And verse 39, the Holy Spirit, they come up, the Spirit of God. Thank God for the Spirit. The work is done. The Spirit of God says, pop you go. I'm going to take you. And the funny thing is he found his way in totally Ashdod. That is the old name. But in verse 40, it simply tells us, uh, first found in Astorces, which is the old Ashdod, one of the Phil Philippi uh, Philistines' town, which was basically thrown up and beaten up by the, uh, by the Greek. Passing through, he preached in the cities until he came to Caesarea. So he went all around. Think about this. He has to go back to Jerusalem through Samaria and then come back all the way to Caesarea. What a zigzag way the Holy Spirit leading. If you turn to Acts chapter 21 and verse 8, in the course of the missionary journey, Philip, uh, Paul wanted to find a place in Caesarea. And where do you think he finds it? In chapter 8 of the book of Acts 21 and 8, next day we were in Paul's company, departed, and we entered the house of Philip the evangelist. Now he's not simply a waiter on the table, far beyond, God, the Holy Spirit, has exhorted him and given him one of the fivefold ministry. Evangelist Philip. What? And, his, and he had four daughters. They were, they, uh, they were basically uh, prophesying. They were prophetesses. Amazing, isn't it? And so you close with this in the last in verse 40, Acts chapter 8 and verse 40, and we just close in a word of prayer. And Philip was found and passing through the city. This is what he did. He preached.